Welcome, golfers, to the next episode of the Read It, Roll It, Hold It podcast. Today, we've uh, got special guest Ian Heifeld on the call. Welcome, Ian. Hey, man, how you doing? Thanks, yeah. for, uh, thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Thank you for coming on. Uh, yeah, really excited to talk to you uh, today. We've just had a nice little conversation before we come on air. And you are, um, you, well, what do you do? It's like the inventor of game like training. Uh, you're the director at uh, the mental performance at Bishop's Gate. Is that right? No, so not, not anymore. I, uh, I moved from Bishop's Gate. Um, basically, I, I, was in, I was in England uh, working yeah. with Mark Pearson. Really okay. good coach, and I worked with some of his tour players, Sam Connor, European tour player, Chris Hansen, European tour player. Um, and I worked a little bit with England schools. I did some presentations for England schools. And, and this, was, this was like, I guess, 12 years ago. Uh, and I started a small company with Matthew Cook called Leap Golf. Okay. Uh, and um, Daniel Gavin's another person who, who went from the Euro Pro to the... Um, to the European tour. He, he worked with myself and Mark and was involved with Leap Golf. And then what happened was uh, the Gary Gilchrist Golf Academy um, saw some of the work that I was doing, invited me to the US. The Gary Gilchrist Golf Academy kind of divided and, and half of it turned into the Bishop's Gate Golf Academy. I became the director of performance there. The Bishop's Gate Golf Academy bought IJGA international junior golf academy and appointed uh, a welshman stuart morgan yeah uh, director and now stuart morgan is by far and away in in my opinion one of if not the best golf coach in the world wow. um is unreal and i got two and a half years working under him under yep. his energy his passion his um let's just say attention to detail <laughs> Uh, his knowledge, his drive to be better. Um, so I, I was working as director of performance at Bishopsgate and at IJGA. Um, and then I just wanted to give things a go on my own. So I started Game Like Training Golf with, um, with Matthew, Matthew Cook. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah, we, we created a, a website and a, I guess an education framework and a coaching framework that ultimately educates and inspires golfers to think a little differently so they can relax and enjoy the game and to practice very differently so they can make swing changes stick uh, and have their range game transfer to the course. And then while I was doing this with game like training, uh, David Ledbetter golf Academy uh, with Zach Parker, again, one of the best golf coaches in the world and one of the best people you could ever hang out with or meet just an awesome guy. Um, he asked me to come across to the Ledbetter Golf Academy uh, and do some consulting there. So, yeah, at the minute, it's, it's game like training, um, the, the online education, the online coaching and the in-person coaching, uh, and then a lot of work for David Ledbetter Golf Academy in Champions Gate, Florida. Um, so it's complex, but we got there. <laughs> Well, I'm glad I, um, you know, did my research well there that, you know, the first thing I introduced you is completely wrong. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I haven't updated my LinkedIn or things like that in a long time. And I know that we were trying to connect before this and my schedule's all in the air. So I'm going to take accountability for that one. That's, that's my bad. We'll blame the internet. The internet was not accurate. Internet's <laughs> wrong. Yeah. yeah. Google. Never. Google's that wrong. would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> Happy days. Is that your dog there in the, uh, is, is he all right or she? Uh, yeah, she's spotted another dog on the balcony and she's going to bark. So that's um, fine. We'll, we'll just have to roll with that, unfortunately. No, that's uh, absolutely fine. Too much, I'll try and silence her. So you're, you're also a dog sitter as well as all the other jobs? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I, didn't, I didn't nominate myself for that one. My fiance kind of nominated it. It was her dream to get a, jo a, a dog. And then uh, she disappears every morning at seven uh, till five and I work from home. So I kind of, by default, uh, have, have a, a puppy, 10 month old puppy who now is in big enough to cause damage, but still in the puppy mindset where she wants to play. So it's, it's chaotic. It's chaotic. <laughs> sounds, uh, sounds, she's uh, keeps you on your toes, right? Yeah. She's ruined many a podcast. So let's see if we can, how we can get on with this one. <laughs> we'll just get, we'll just get her on the show. <laughs> see what she's got to say. Cool, man. So you were talking about Stuart Morgan. Wow. You're saying he is 
like the you know his his energy and his passion like the reason we connected is i've heard you on numerous things follow game like training for a while i'm like i've been drawn to that with you like tell me tell, tell me more about that like where does that come from oh i mean i think <clears throat> when i was young um i i failed and i didn't have the people around me to teach me about the benefits of goal setting to tell me that effort is more important than outcome to tell me that the brain and body can adapt and change and if you practice deliberately and purposefully and and um push through failure then you will get to where you want to be i i didn't know those things so I was kind of natural as an athlete, as a junior, but I didn't put the effort in or I didn't um, engage in the process, as we would say, to the extent that I could because I didn't know about it. So when I went to college, um, realistically, I got, I got caught out and the sporting world came uh, crashing down uh, around me and I replaced that with the odd beer <laughs> and the odd nightclub up in Leeds. Um, and, I, and I, when I was 24, 25, I was working, I wasn't fulfilled. I was earning decent money, but I, it was just like a, a job. And I thought, I want to really do something that, that fuels my energy and fuels my passion. Um, and I loved golf. I'd played golf as a junior. I loved sport. And I was getting very interested in the workings of the human mind. Um, so I reached out and I, I started to evolve um, my own personal golf play, junior golfers at the golf club that I was at, Cookridge Hall Golf Club. Um, and it just fueled me with, with energy. And then it, it started small and it got a little bit of bad press as you do and a little bit of good press. And I rolled with the good press and it just grew and grew from there. And I think now 12 years on, I've got myself into a position where I'm kind of the person or the coach that I needed when I was 12, 15, 20 years old. So those messages that I maybe got a little later in life, not too late, cause it's never too late, but those messages I got later in life, I now try and use golf. Um, I do teach in softball as well, a little bit, um, football or soccer, depending on who's listening a, a little bit um, and personal development. So I do a little bit in schools and things like that, but outside of sport, generally it comes back to sport and we use sport as a vehicle to, to push certain messages. Uh, but it just makes me happy. It makes me fulfilled. And when I sit down to write a book or when I sit down to do a podcast, it's not an effortful thing. My stomach doesn't sink because I have a boss that's going to tell me, Hey, this is no good or any, I'm just kind of free uh, to do what I want. And it, it, it's taken a while, but the last couple of years, say I've been doing it maybe 10, 12 years, the last couple of years, financial um, sort of stability is kind of just about tagged along um, with it. Um, so that's why I guess I'm always happy because I think I don't really have the financial worries that I used to when I started this journey. And I'm very fulfilled as a, as a person. Um, so it's just, uh, it's just fun. It's just fun for me right now. I'm glad I, I'm glad I took the gamble and I, I try and teach other people to maybe do the same or not even see it as a gamble, just see it as, Hey, do, do what you want to do with, with, with your life every day. And eventually the, the safety that you maybe is keeping you away from doing that will, will follow. I love that. It's great to hear you, you know, talk about that and you're in a great place in life. And, you know, you mentioned dogs and fiancés and stuff. So like, <laughs> life's good, man. <clears throat> it's good yeah, good absolutely. Absolutely. Um, going, go, just taking you back there, you, you know, you mentioned, um, um, God, dogs, the dog's thrown me. Can I blame the dog? For <laughs> absolutely. I blame her for loads of stuff that I don't do as well. So yeah, yeah. Blame, blame the dog. Blame the dog. I I've got it. So you mentioned that you're now a coach that you would have liked to have um, had. Yes. Does that make sense? Um, what, what is that coach now? Well, I think, I think I did have that coach in certain aspects. So my dad was a 
a very, very, very um, innovative, creative rugby coach. Kind of went against the grain, believed in playing the game a little differently. And he coached me from the age of eight to oh, 17. Um, and I played with some good players that went on to be professional. I never made it myself, but I played at a university. And, you know, I think a lot of what my dad did is in my coaching now. Um, but perhaps some of the tools that I, I, I wasn't given by the environment around me might have been something like, you know, I was told that I was a natural. Hmm. I was also told that I had great hands when I played rugby, but I was slow, but my hands made up for it. And at no point did I ever believe that I could get faster. I didn't know. <clears throat> I thought abilities were fixed. <clears throat> and then because I was a natural, I didn't believe in training effort. I used to turn up to training to have fun, which is okay when you're eight, nine, 10, 11, but when you're on the fringes of the university first team and things like that, that's not where you want to be. Like, actually, you've got to put more effort into practice than maybe a match. You've got to get the, the credits in the bank in training than um, more so than in the match. The match is where you're free and automated and everything you've built just comes out. And that didn't happen to me because because I was given the tag of maybe being a natural, because I viewed abilities as being fixed, I got very focused on not failing. Don't fail. Protect yourself. So I played safe. I played a small game. I played safe. And I guess I just sort of cruised by with the natural level of, of sporting prowess that I'd, that I'd developed. And obviously the influence of my father and watching a lot of rugby, I had a head start on a lot of, a lot of young kids. Same with golf. I had a head start on a lot of young kids um, and I was always pretty decent, played for the city and the county, uh, junior golf, <clears throat> but never ever viewed like, hey, if I wanted to go after this, anyone can do it. For some people, it's harder, but if you put the correct amount of hours in, the human brain is blessed with a gift. The human body is blessed with a gift and that's the gift of adaptability. And if you think in a certain way, and practice in a certain way, you can take advantage of that gift and you can achieve excellence. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So now I, I teach that. Um, and I teach that. Uh, I, I teach that message. I share that message. I share my story. And I also um, make sure that when golfers, softball players, football slash soccer players, come to see me and it's mainly golf I'm probably 85 80 85 percent golf when they turn up to see me they know that practice is about being uncomfortable it's about failing it's games and challenges that are harder than tournament play if it's technical practice it is going to hurt it's going to be slow swings it's going to be you're going to feel your muscles you're going to be really focused and deliberate when you come to me to work on a technical change, you will leave mentally shattered, but physically you won't feel it. You'll feel some tweaks in the muscles, but you won't feel it because the environment that I'm trying to create, I'm trying to engage you in this process so you can take advantage of that, that gift of adaptability. Um, so I guess I teach more of a, a process orientated approach. Don't worry about results. Don't worry about failure. Let's, um, look at effort levels on a daily basis. Let's look at daily habits. Let's look at what the best in the world do and model them. Let's, you know, and, and, and if you do all these things, if you set goals, if you understand what you want, how you're going to get there and why, eventually, if you are resilient, if you don't give up, you can reach those goals. And my, I think my message that I speak to people reflects that. And I think that the way that I teach people to train and think on the golf course or whatever sports field really, really reflects that. Um, so yeah, I guess you could say on the nature versus nurture argument, I'm very, very big on the, on the nurture side. Um, I, I just don't buy into the concept that there's these ceilings and this doesn't come from me. Dr. Anders Ericsson, 
probably the greatest professor in, in human performance, um, unfortunately passed away recently. I spent time with him at Florida State asking him questions. I've seen his research. He gave up his time to tell, teach me about what excellence is. And he believes that and his research pointed to that. And, and I believe him. And now I'm trying to take his work and make it a little more digestible and a little more practical um, for the golf world, for the corporate world and for other, other sports worlds. Brilliant stuff. What were like the biggest learnings you got from, from him? Oh man. Uh, so he wrote a book called peak and um, that's a very good book. And I guess the biggest thing is if you want to learn something, um, muscle memory doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> rep after rep after rep hitting a ball on the range is not a good idea because that's only part of the process of hitting a shot. So people say they want to get their reps in, but when you hit a shot on the range, it's not actually a total rep because a total rep involves planning, involves acting, and then involves reflecting. And often on the range, it's just act, 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 act. So we learn through this cognitive stress, this cognitive stimulation of the brain. And if you go and play golf on the golf course and you have a, a ball below feet lie with a crosswind um, to a tuck left pin and there's water around the green, your brain has to have had a representation of hitting that shot before or a similar shot that it can adapt. This is the chunking process. We take pieces of information and we chunk it together and then we make a meaningful picture. Um, that is what Dr. Erickson taught me is so important in golf, the total process of, of hitting the shot. And then he also taught me the importance of when you're on the golf course with players, have them think aloud because what would be in the player's brain is a mystery. We don't know. We don't know. So they can be having a practice swing and they can look like Justin Rose. They can do the thing with the club and they can have this great practice swing, but they might be thinking, Oh man, I hope I can get that cheeseburger that I had yesterday from the bar when this hellish round is over. You just don't know. So Asking the player to talk aloud or think aloud while hitting a shot gives me an insight into their cognitive process and their ability to chunk information. And then it also gives the player an awareness of why the heck am I thinking this? Hmm. How did I miss that wind or how, or yeah, I know that. And then often you can then start talking about, well, you probably missed it because you've got ineffective practice. So we have to look at getting you in this environment more. Um, or maybe you missed it because of fear of the outcome of the shot or the stress response or whatever it might be. Um, but to be honest, a Dr. Erickson, like that, that's what he taught me with golf. But then I think in life, he loved what he did and he just did it to the best of his ability. And he was obsessed, obsessed with his craft. And when you're around people that are obsessed with their craft, uh, it, it, it wears off on you. So um, I feel like he was someone, his writings and his time and his emails probably gave me a, uh, the, a, a, the belief that, yeah, you, you can do this if you go after it. Love it. It sounds like a great mentor and, you know, you are definitely obsessed as well. Right. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm diversifying a little bit now, as we spoke about, I'm obsessed now. I was obsessed with getting into the golf world and revolutionizing the way that golf is practiced and that golfers play, that golfers think when they play. That was my, that was my goal. And I'm still obs obsessed with doing that but I'm more niche now. I'm obsessed with doing it 
with junior golfers, collegiate golfers, and maybe mini tour players that are relatively young. Because I think if a student comes to me who's either in college on the fringes of the college team and wants to break in, or if a high school player comes to me that's not quite good enough to get in college, but you know they're pretty athletic and they can hit the ball and they can break 80 and just need that little bit of a boost. Number one, they're the people I enjoy working with the most and seem to get the best results out of. But number two, they're of an age where the tools that I give them in golf, they're really going to impact their life. They can take these and they can apply this into being a husband, into a brother, into a friend, into a teacher, into a lawyer, whatever it, it might be. Um, so I'm still obsessed with it, but I'm trying now. I, I do say no to working with people. It's very rare that I'll work with the standard, you know, 25 handicapper because it's just, it doesn't have the, the impact on them. And my time is now limited as it does on these junior golfers. So that's really where I'm trying to put my time and, and energy. I love it. I love it. You mentioned, um, Obviously, you, you coach golfers, not just golf, but life skills, if you like, if that's what you'd call them, maybe you'd call them. What are the main skills you coach them? You know, <laughs> I think we have it wrong. There's a great TED Talk by a guy called Sean Acker, The Science of Happiness. And he talks about, I can't remember if it's Harvard or Stanford, one of the big schools in the US, Ivy League schools. He talks about how miserable a lot of the students are because of the pressure to perform academically and get results. Hmm. And it's always, he says in this TED talk, we have it the wrong way around. It's like, hey, when I get this grade and then when I get this job and then when I get this level in this job, I will be happy. And he's like, no, you've got to be happy to get the grade, to get this, to get that. So I try and I help the players that I work with outside of, of a golf score, seek value and purpose in their life outside of a score. If you connect your identity to a score, you are going to be disappointed a lot. You are going to be unhappy. And then let's say you do get the score. All you want now is the next level. Oh, I'm in college. Now I want to be in the team. I'm in the team. Now I want to be NCAA champion. Oh, I'm NCAA champion. Now I want to be a pro. Oh, I'm a pro and I kept my card. Now I want to win a major. Oh, now I've won a major. Now I want to get in the Ryder Cup. It never stops. So we go on this endless quest looking for happiness in outcomes um, and sort of what we, what we own um, and, and in results. And really happiness is more internal in your daily habits in your, the way you live your life, in um, doing small things like writing a list of 10 things you're going to achieve in that day and just checking them off one by one. That can make you happy. Um, paying back the coffee at Dunkin' Donuts or at Starbucks or wherever it is, just paying for the car behind you, that can make you happy. You know, those kind of things matter. If you put effort level into a test. If you sit down and say, I'm going to study for this test 35 minutes a night for six nights in a row, that should make you happier if you commit to that and do that than the actual outcome of the test. We have to assume, especially in this crazy world with social media and the impacts that's having on young children, especially young girls that don't want to put pictures of themselves up and the, the, the gratification that we're getting is all external. And I'm trying to teach students that happiness is more internal processes. Um, so for example, I ask parents a lot of the time, please don't put pictures of your students' scores on Instagram. Please don't put pictures of them with a trophy. Put the picture of them on the range saying how proud you are that they're staying on a Sunday evening at 5 p.m. while it's getting dark to try and master their craft. And if parents can do that, 
The kid then relates happiness to effort level and engaging in something that they love, not score. And that, that's critical in, in this world. So I think that's where I try and start my coaching. I have a parent education guide, which I'm happy to send to you and you can send out to your whole, um, whole network. Uh, that highlights that because the environment yeah the environment is so powerful if we can change the environment um we can change our kids ways that they derive happiness and i think it sounds crazy but i think we can make the world like a a calmer better place um less less and look i'm not i'm not about participation medals right there's got to be winners there's got to be losers um and you've got to learn to deal with that. But if you take a tough loss and you're really disappointed and then you push on and you go to practice the next day, then you should find happiness in that action. Um, so I'm, I'm really trying to push that message with, with the coaching and help players just find fulfillment. Help players understand that true fulfillment lies in the process of how you live your life, not the outcomes that, that you get. Tiger Woods might be a great example of that right now. Hmm. Well, it's, um, you, you know, you're talking so much sense. I like, it's just, it's powerful stuff, man. And um, yeah, I love it. I love it. My head's spinning with a million one questions <laughs> and I've not even looked at my questions yet. Um, I, I want to talk to, to, I want to talk about practice. I want to talk about um, Osvia and, and Inky Johnson. That They're things that have just come Oh yeah, up. yeah. Inky's the man. Um Let's start with practice. Going back yeah. to practice, right? Like, there's a lot of guys, or there's a few of you then around that I, I know of, that, you know, yourself and Adam Young and um, Peter Arnott in Scotland and, uh, you know, Richard Franklin and doing a lot of stuff with Discover Golf, like really changing the way people practice, which I think is like so educational. Why, why do you think that, Traditionally, golf has been practiced the complete opposite to that. Okay. The, I, I've just recently started answering this question like this, right? I blame corporate America. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you why. So Dr. Tim Lee, Dr. Robert Bjork, Dr. Anders Ericsson, um, Dr. Fran Pirizzolo, all people have been around, experts in learning, they didn't design the golf range. Experts in learning and human performance did not design the golf range. The golf range was designed by rich American corporate country mm. clubs because it made sense. Because golf takes five hours sometimes to get round. And there's Wall Street guys and there's attorneys and there's um, teachers that all have limited time. So they turn up to their country club and if they can't play nine holes or 18 holes because they don't have time, there's this vast amount of land that looks beautiful with the pyramids of golf balls and the targets that you can go hit on. So because in 2021, one of the most precious resources we have is time. We have very, the world is as fast paced and as crazy as it's ever been. So the golf range attracts you there because you can save time. And corporate America built it to service their customers as they should, but it was never ever designed by a learning expert. And then if you take it to the next step, what do humans desire? Deep down at our core, we wanna be comfortable, we wanna be safe, and we wanna feel good. What does the golf range do? It helps you hit that push draw, 20 times in a row, you feel comfortable, you feel safe, you feel good. Now, that doesn't transfer to the golf course. That's just a scientific fact. So we're turning up onto a piece of grass that's not designed by a learning expert, and we're looking for comfort, safety, and to feel good. The golf course is very, very different piece of grass to the range. And comfort, safety, and feeling good are not going to happen on the golf course. It's chaos. It's a problem-solving game, and you've got to learn to adapt. And the golf range teaches zero. 
zero adaptability. So what we have now is we have a pandemic, if, if you like, not to use that, that word, uh, of I can't take my range game to the course. Why do I hit it so good on the range, but I can't take it to the golf course? Such a common thing for people to say, isn't it? Yeah. Every, why can't I, it. Yeah. Well, I hit it so good on the range and then it's a different. And I say to, the, I say to people, and I think I took this from, from um, Peter on it and Graham McDowell. So I'll, I'll credit them. Great guys. Met their, their stuff, Stuart Morgan, Peter on it, Graham McDowell, Adam Young, all, all producing um, good stuff in, in practice. There's another guy called Will Wu uh, out of a, a university in California who's, who's got some decent stuff, uh, good stuff out there as well. Um, but ultimately I ask people that work with me, would you learn to swim in the bathtub? <laughs> Go home tonight, fill your bath with water and then just work on your stroke in the bath. Your stroke will probably improve. It, technically, it will look better. But then when you go and dive in the sea, good luck with that one. <laughs> You're going to drown. So true, isn't it? Pia yeah. Nielsen's another one who talks about this. I'm reading her book, Be a Player at the Moment. They're, they are two awesome uh, human beings. They're very, very, very uh, caring, uh, compassionate ladies, good golfers. And they produce some excellent stuff. And yeah, they're aware of this as well. They're very much into trying to get golfers to uh, train on the golf course, adapt to their environment. But ultimately, that, that's it. it. The golf range wasn't designed by experts in learning. High performance is about stress inoculation and adaptability and dealing with variability and dealing with problems and dealing with chaos. That's what golfers do. Um, Dustin Johnson right now, better than anyone else in the world. He adapts his swing motion to the pressure of having to um, shoot a certain score to win a green jacket and to the extreme chaos and demands that that environment, Augusta, the changing lies, the fast greens, that that um, provides. He was the best at inoculating his stress response and he was the best at adapting his motion to the demands of the environment because he's played so many tournament rounds and he's played there and he's got the ability to adapt and he can see shots in his mind. And you do not build the ability to do that on the golf range. Absolutely not. And um, I'm spending, I'm trying to make the range as chaotic as possible because I know people need to be there for time. But more, 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 more. I'm on the I'm on the golf course. What would um you say that golf rangers weren't built by um, professors of learning? What would they build for golf? Do you think a golf hole? <laughs> is it, yeah, is it like is that the answer? Uh, is it, no, I it, think you know Darren May, who coaches Keegan Bradley, English guy, super super smart. Darren May is so smart. He's, he's, he'd be a great podcast guest. I saw him we speak. We, we share a lot of the same reading list. And whenever I see him, I really like being in his company. Really, really smart. He's out in, um, in the US and he designed the range for Michael Jordan's uh, golf course. And they do, he has a business, or it was, I haven't seen it for a while. It was called Every Ball Counts. Okay. So on the range, there's like targets that are, if it's a hundred yard shot, there's a circle around the hundred yard pin for what a PGA tour player would hit it. So now you can start to measure something. And then actually when I was at Bishop's gate, the range had fairways cut into it. Um, and you can go forward and you know, sometimes how the tees are elevated, you could hit off a downhill lie from oh, the front cool. of the tee uphill from the back, right? Ball above and ball below when you go left and right. Now, uh, then you need different grasses. Um, some days you might need a fan to blow wind because it might not be there. Like you, you, if you could, if I could design a, a golf range, I think I could get it pretty close um, to being awesome. It would probably cost about a trillion dollars. Uh, and the ground staff would be retiring after three days when they see how people are walking around. I'd have no pyramids of balls or none of that brand standards, none of that country club feel. 
it would be absolute chaos. Um, people would probably get hit with golf balls, so it wouldn't be safe. Like it would just be madness. I don't <laughs> think I could ever. I don't think you could ever quite do it to the extreme um, that I would that I would want to. If anyone's listening and has got the money, I would love to give it a go. Maybe there's a business opportunity there. Um, but so I think there's certain things that you can do that will help, like spacing, variability, and challenge. And that's in my my best-selling book, Golf Practice. Um, and by best-selling, I mean best-selling of mine, not best-selling out of other people's books. Um, yeah, so spacing effect is time between each shot. Variability effect is change in task. And challenge is like the self-measure of playing for a score. So if you think, if I watch a club golfer on the range, they probably hit 10 balls in about five minutes. I would say that those 10 balls need to probably be about 15 minutes. And then you need, that's the spacing effect. So you've increased the space between each shot. Yeah. And what that does, that makes your brain engage. You hit a shot, you wait one minute, you hit another shot, your brain has had one minute to forget what you just did. So now you're challenging your work in memory to recall that previous rep. Now, if there's only five seconds between the rep and you hit that nice push draw, you don't have to plan that shot now. You're just doing a physical repeat of what you did. That doesn't stimulate the brain. It doesn't stimulate muscle memory because that doesn't exist. And the brain is not engaged. It's not being challenged. You've got to challenge the brain. You've got to create that cognitive stress. So... The person who hits five balls in two minutes versus the person who hits five balls in seven minutes, the person who hits the five balls in seven minutes, there's more chance of that swing change sticking or that performance level sticking because their brain has been engaged in every shot because it's had to, because it's been challenged to recall because of the space between each shot. The space is longer. Then if you throw in variability, so if you throw in changing in task, so now I'm going to hit, the person next to me is going to hit 10 balls in five minutes, and I'm going to hit 10 balls in 20 minutes. And the first five balls, I'm going to work on my swing very deliberately, one ball every sort of minute and a half. And then the next five balls, I'm going to go driver, iron, pitch driver iron and i'm going to be aiming at a target and i'm going to write down how far that ball finished from the target now i then i go back to the five balls working on swing so then my brain goes mm, we've just hit five shots to target what was i doing when i was working on my swing again and that's how we learn golf practice is not about getting the feeling and keeping it it's about losing the feeling and being able to recall it. Wow. Um, I'm going to credit Robbie Fails for that. Robbie Fails, one of the best <clears throat> young golf coaches in the USA, told me that. And I just, oh. told him, yeah, I just told him I'm stealing that. And he just laughed and said, that's fine. I've stolen enough <laughs> of your stuff, he said, so that's fine. So great, uh, great golf coach, but very profound. And that, that put it in a, in a nutshell for me. Um, good. So when you go to the range... Look to create space between each shot. Look to create variability and look to create challenge. If you do that, you'll have more chance of making swing changes stick and transfer to the golf course than if you just beat ball after ball after ball. Because muscle memory doesn't exist. Your muscles don't have memory and your brain is going to switch off. It's boring. You're not challenging your mind. Your brain switches off and the cognitive stress is, is zero. You're just in a little physical exercise. So you hit those 100 push draws, but it's not going to, it's just temporary. Whereas if you practice with spacing, variability, and challenge, it's actually contributing to the retention and hopefully the transfer of the skill. Well, that last two minutes is the, is the gold. 
you need, you need to bottle that 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 shit and sell it. Well, yeah. <laughs> well that's what it is. That's what's in my book. Um, cool. That's what's in my book. And I think I wrote the book maybe coming up to about two years ago. Um, and there's references to Dr. Erickson in the book. There's references to Dr. Tim Lee. Um, it teaches you how, if you're going to use training aids. And it actually gives you some practice circuits. Now, since then, and, and, and it, look, it, it breaks it down. If you're training to learn, you want spacing, variability, and challenge, but you're implementing it so that a swing change sticks. If you're training to perform, you want spacing, variability, and challenge, but you're implementing it in a way where that the skill will transfer to the golf course. So part of this is about how do we retain movements? Part of this is about how we transfer movements. And my, my book, Golf Practice, how do you take your range game to the course? How to practice golf and take your range game to the course, um, which is what it's called, um, clearly breaks that down and gives you practical ways of doing it. There will be a second edition of the book, and th that book will be literally just practice circuits for learning and for skill transfer on course challenges. So this first one gives you a bit like what we've talked about, and it gives you a taste of how you can practice. The up and coming one will give you literally, right, here's 50 games for skill transfer. Here's 50 games for um, skill retention on the range. Here's 50 games for skill transfer on the golf course, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Love it. Put me down for one. <laughs> I will do. I will do. I'll have one. <laughs> Just some... Um... I don't know where this sits in, but I'd like to share something that myself and uh, one of my colleagues, we, we had a range lesson with um, 12 beginner ladies and um, it was the autumn. So there was a load of leaves on top of the range. So they were topping a lot of shots. It, hopefully at the end of the session, they were topping less, but a load of balls went into the leaves, which the ball machine couldn't pick up. Anyway, so we, after the session, had to go and get the balls out of the leaves, right? Yeah. And we were, um, we, we went in there, started flicking them out with our wedge and within 30 seconds to a minute, we just realized how much fun we were having. Like, oh my God, I've never, I can't remember feeling so excited. And we, you couldn't even see the ball. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And we figured out the best way to play it was like a bunker shot, right? Because the ball's not on the ground. And we were messing. Yep. And for about a quarter of an hour, we're hitting like draw bunker shots, a high one, low one, messing about. And I, I don't know, like, where, where does that kind of practice sit in? And obviously creative practice is, is important. Yeah, I think that you are putting yourself in a situation that maybe you will face on the golf course, right? So let's be specific with yours. You hit it in the rough. There's a ton of leaves. You can't move the ball. And um, you now are starting to build up a mental data bank of how you hit that shot. So even though that it's a very, very rare shot that you were working on, the, the, the philosophy is very much the, the same for golf practice. So you recreated and simulated a situation that you might face on the golf course maybe twice a season, mm -hmm. okay? But it was fun, it was problem solving, and you worked it out. Therefore, that solution is going to stick and you are going to learn to adapt. I think golf practice, what you've done for a situation that might occur a couple of times a season, should be about situations that will occur more regularly. So you want to recreate and simulate situations you will face in tournament play, be it the... Um, pro tournaments for money, be it the junior golf or college golf, be it your club championship, be it trying to get your handicap down from 18. Practice is about recreating and simulating situations you'll face on the golf course so that when they come, you have a better chance of solving that problem than if you've just beat balls on the range. So I think that um, when you go and you're on the range and you say, right, I have, um, I have, I want to make more birdies. I want to make more birdies. That's a situation that uh, I, if 
find myself in, I want, I average half a birdie around. I want to average one and a half to two birdies around. So I need to recreate and simulate that situation in practice. If I'm going to make more birdies on the golf course, I got to figure out a way of simulating that in practice. So you can play a game, 45 minutes. You've got to hit a driver into a 30 yard wide fairway. You've got to hit an iron. Maybe it's your wedge or your nine iron to inside 20 feet of a target. And then you've got to go hole an eight foot putt. If you do all three of them in a row, you get a point. Love it. If at any point you fail on the driver or the iron shot, you may maybe have a one minute timeout or a two minute timeout where you're not allowed to do anything. You just have to stand still. And that's punishment, right? It's eating away at the clock. It's less chance for you to then go and work on making birdies. The 45 minutes is ticking down. You're feeling the pressure. Now you stand there with your driver. You know it's a one-minute time penalty. You know you need to hit it into this narrow 30-yard wide fairway. And the juices are flowing a little bit like they would in tournament play. So you learn to inoculate the stress response. And then when you make one time, you'll make four or five points. And you've hold four or five eight-footers. There's a mental representation of making some birdies in practice that you can now carry with you um, onto the golf course. So, um, yeah, that's I, I like what you're saying. And the thing is, as well, what what why you said it with such energy and passion, and what I've seen is it's fun and engaging. Mm. And what I just told you has levels. It has a score. It has an outcome. There's a time constraint. You know what it's like? It's like playing PlayStation or playing Xbox. And that industry is a billion, billion, billion dollar industry, whatever it is, because people get addicted to it. Definitely. Having gamifying something, having levels, chasing a score, failing, and then getting an extra life, playing the boss level. I don't know if you remember like Sonic the Hedgehog, the boss level. It would always be like, have you got to the boss level yet? I build those into practices for my students. They get addicted to golf practice because it's structured like a PlayStation game um, with levels and scores. But also what it's doing is it's recreating and simulating situations they're going to face on the golf course. And it's incorporating spacing, variability and challenge. And, and that's why it works. Um, and, you know, players I work with, do they get better straight away? No. Actually, because practice is stressful and hard, they kind of fail. So they might take a little dint in confidence straight away, but push through that. And over a longer period of time, you'll start to make regular small gains. And in golf, there's no such thing as a quick fix. There's no, um, there's no way that you can just change a swing. It all takes time. We have to delay the gratification. And, and practicing in this way definitely does that. Um, but I believe it's only for, I guess, the more motivated golfer or golfer with the ability to, to put these things um, into play. Yeah, the committed, the committed golfer, isn't it? I, I've, uh... Yeah, I've had club golfers. Um, so Atlanta Athletic Club here, um, has an unbelievable sort of 25, 30 guys, scratch players that can all win the club championship. Like it's a crazy private country club. Um, but my guys there that I work with, uh, Dimitri uh, and Mike, they're as committed as the tour players. Hmm. So I'll, I'll, train a, a, I'll train one of my players, Anthony, who's on PGA Tour Canada. And Anthony will train with Mike and he'll train with Dimitri. And I just put it on Instagram yesterday. I put them through a practice challenge. I put them through a practice challenge and it literally, um, it's the same practice challenge, but we just slightly adjust it for the amateurs and the pros and they compete. And I saw the behaviors in Mike and Dimitri emerge on the range in this practice challenge that would have emerged in tournament play. So it gave me a coaching moment. Hmm. It gave me a coaching moment. 
So we intercepted and we talked about Dimitri's pre-shot planning. We talked about Mike's post-shot routine and his attentional focus over the ball. Um, and then I did a little bit with Dimitri on visualization because I could see the rules of the game, very similar to the one I just explained, were forcing Dimitri to speed up and they were forcing Mike to get stressed. Now, the funny thing was with Anthony, who plays on the PGA Tour Canada, they didn't force anything. He just ignored it and went about his business, which is what you would expect from someone playing at that level. Um, so it's probably a little bit too easy for Anthony, but it was optimal challenge point for the other two because they broke down and gave, it gave me a coaching moment. Um, and those club golfers that engage in that, they love it because they actually even put money on the point system. So they were playing for Chipotle and money. So we had 90 minutes on the range, but we really got them fired up and I saw the mental errors that they would potentially make in the club championship. So now through that environment that was created and through them getting stressed in practice, gave me that window to coach. And they're probably a tiny bit closer to having the right mental habits ready for the club championship. You wouldn't have just got that from, from beating balls. And if you don't want to fail, and if you don't want to get stressed in practice and you want to be comfortable, I'm not the I'm not the person to to help with that. It's not going to lead to you getting to your goals and dreams. But even if you're off 20 handicap and you're willing to fail and willing to put the effort in and willing to do what Mike and Dimitri did, then it it it, it will help you. Love it. You're building that resilience up in players, aren't you? That's what I I'm sort of hearing. Uh, uh, yeah, agree. And you know you. I guess there's players that haven't trained like this that are just extremely resilient. Maybe that comes from their social background. Maybe it comes in their biology. I don't know. But I look at someone like Matt Wallace and I, I don't know how Matt Wallace um, practices, but Matt Wallace seems to just have this, this natural resilience. You see it in Patrick Reed as well. Patrick Reed has this natural resilience to just block out all the BS that's surrounding him. Matt, Matt, the same. Um, Tiger had it, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was like instilled into him like a microchip, right? So I, I think, can you make it to the elite level without doing this? Yeah, some people do. Tiger Woods probably... Block practice, Serena Williams, block practice, beat balls. Um, Alex Norren, um, I've, I, I got clipped on a podcast, made me sound really bad what I said about Alex Norren and, I, and I, it was taken a little out of context, so I have to be careful. But Alex Norren hitting a thousand balls and, and having those marks on his hand. Um, it's Alex Norren, right? He's a phenomenal player. Anyone would take, no, 99.9% .9 of people would take Alex Norren's career. So can you make it without doing this stuff? Yes. Mm. But I think the people that do get to those levels, Tiger, Serena, Alex Norren, people like that, I think they might be the exceptions to the rule. So I don't think we should be modeling them. And also maybe if Tiger had practiced like this when he was younger, would he have the spine issues? I don't know if that comes from rep after rep after rep. And the traditional thing about grooving your swing and muscle memory, I, I think it's very interesting. And I'm the biggest Tiger Woods fan out there. I have been forever. Um, it's very hard to, to say that. I'm not saying that he should have done this. What I'm saying is it might have led to less repetitions, but some of them of more of a higher quality. Okay. Uh, and then, not that he would be a better player, but he might have a might his body might be in a better physical state. Who knows? Because I, I think when a student comes to you, you have to guard them against psychological burnout. You have to guard them against physical burnout, um, and you have to help them be happy and and make it fun. And I think this training does that as well. Totally, totally interesting stuff. Uh, Ian, I, I really enjoy practicing topping the ball. Okay. But what uh, I, I like, 
so I'll tell you the story, a funny story. We're actually in Augusta. In um, what's uh, we went to a Masters nearly two years ago, and um, I think we flew into Atlanta, then went down to Columbia. So it was in Columbia. Okay. We were playing golf for the members. Oh, someone uh, a bird just hit the window. Maybe jump. <laughs> Bloody hell. Um, so uh, what was I saying? Oh, yes, yeah, so we're on the range. And the first time I play this guy and it's like hot. You know, he's like, he's a like massive over technical bloke and like loves to pull a prank, but he's like in like nobody's sweating and stuff on the course beforehand. Yeah, right? yeah. So I'm on the range and we haven't played together. So I get my wedge out and I just start topping a few away. And he's a bit like, so I got his attention quick and I'm like, God, what's going on? Like playing a game now. So I had 10, 15 balls and I topped everyone. I changed clubs, try different things. And he's like stressing out, but he's also trying to give me tips and stuff. Anyway, so I'm like playing the game and I get down the first hole, like 420, like smashed a drive straight down the middle, knocked it like an eight iron or something to about a foot. <laughs> okay. And he was just like, completely lost and I, I shared with him the, what the lesson perhaps I was trying to help him with is like yeah just to to chill out a bit but um yeah what what's your thoughts on practicing well, I, topping it I I actually I I don't do it personally because I'm I was a club golfer my highlight I think I shot one under par round Cookridge in a medal and I won one board competition where maybe I shot level par in windy conditions. So there's my golf, right? I was a three, four handicapper. Same. Um, yeah. And I don't play so much uh, right now. Um, I think last time I did play, I maybe had like five birdies and shot 79. So that tells you what's going on in and around those, those birdies. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't, I can't comment from my own standpoint, but in my coaching, I do, I do ask, people to work on drills where they'll hit it out the toe, out the heel and out the center, or they'll have balls on five or six. They'll put five balls in a row on the grass, differing tee heights. Hmm. And you have to hit the center of the face off the differing tee heights. And the reason I do that science calls it perception, action, coupling. So ultimately what we're working on is we're working on low point control, with the different T heights, and we're working on center face contact. Now, if you want to learn to hit the ball out the center of the face, it absolutely makes sense to hit it out the heel and the toe. That's mm -hmm. going to help you find the center. If you want to learn to control the, um, the low point of the golf swing, it makes sense to hit balls off grass and off high tees because your perception of what's going on and your action of what you're doing they should couple together. Good players have the ability, perception, action, coupling. They can couple together what they perceive is happening and their actual action. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whereas poorer players, when you say, right, why are you hitting it fat? Oh, I don't know. And they can't stop that. Lifted why are you head. hitting it thin? <laughs> That's my dad. Let's dedicate that one to my dad because he still thinks that that's his biggest issue in golf. Um, so, <laughs> have you not been able to convince him? Oh man, I can't. I can't. That's the toughest client, right there. He did. You know what? He doesn't implement what I coach with himself. But you know what he'll do? He'll teach it to his friends. Really? If you want to be my dad's four ball partner? You're going to go through an indirect boot camp of my drills. Love but that. my dad won't go through those drills himself. I don't believe. <laughs> I don't believe. Um, so, yeah, I, I really like uh, what you've said um, regarding uh, the top in it because science supports that. So when you're topping it, it's giving you an awareness of what a top isn't. Mm -hmm. It's Got really you. that when you're when you're hitting it out. The, and some people with the with the toe toe heel center drill. They probably find the toe pretty easily. Try and hit the heel, it hits the center. Try and hit the heel, can't get there. Hmm. And then, then you can actually self-correct. What is it? Is it your weight on your heels and your toes? Are you swaying? Is it swing path? What, what might it be? Try and solve the problem yourself. We, 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 a coach should not be a crutch. A coach should be there to create an environment 
that then the individual can solve the problem themselves because then they own that answer. They own that learning experience. If the coach is stepping in and fixing everything, too much information and too much feedback, it degrades learning. And the coach then becomes a crutch. These players can't do anything without looking at their, looking at their player, uh, looking at their coach. Why did that happen? You've got to be a problem solver. You've got to be able to self-correct. When you're out on the golf course, no coach can help you. It's not allowed. You have to be able to self-correct. So that, that drill there, purposely top the ball, purposely hit one thin, then try and hit a good one. That's going to help you have that ability to self-correct when your timing's a little off on the golf ball. Awesome. Thank you for answering that. Um, Ian, I'm like conscious of time. Look, um, I'm looking at my sheet here. I've not asked any of the questions of Os <laughs> Osvia. I want to talk about Osvia. I want to talk about goal setting and Inky Johnson. Perhaps we can do a part two sometime. You know, I know you're a busy guy. So that we can. We got, we've got uh, the dog trainer is coming in about 10, 15 minutes. So I'm happy to roll for about 10, 15 more minutes if you, if you want to, if you've got time. I've uh, I haven't. <laughs> okay, I'm there we go. <laughs> mugging mugging you off here, but no, I haven't. I've got um I've got a lesson. I'm on the lesson tee in three minutes. So oh man, um, okay. I'll so, let you go. Uh, but lesson tee on Zoom on my in my house. But nice. um yeah. So sorry to mug you off there, but I do have to go. But maybe we can do another time. So would, uh, yeah, would love to. And uh, I'll send you the uh, parent guide on Instagram. Perfect. Um, and then anything else that you need if you want like i've got a link tree which has links to my books and links Please. To lot. i have lots of free actually the parent guide is on there on the link tree so i'll message you my link tree feel got free it. to share it with with your listeners and they don't, they don't have to buy the books they don't have to spend money on the online courses there's enough free stuff in there that, that can at least back up what we've talked about so far today Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I really wanted to sort of promote you there um, at the end. But um, yeah, lots of stuff. Like there's so much stuff on there. I'm looking at your tree going, wow, this guy's got a big tree. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's good and, though. And still growing and still growing, hopefully. Absolutely. Not alone the Amazon bulls, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. I'll keep you posted of how that one goes. All right. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Enjoy a lot. Yeah, have a great day.